much. Uh, yeah, just I just want to double check that you guys can hear me and can see my screen. Yeah, I can see it right. I can also perfect. see your pointer. Yeah, perfect. Okay, well, uh, thank you very much to the organizers for letting me speak in this uh, webinar. I'm very, I'm very glad that I have the chance to share some of my the research I've been doing during my PhD. Um, uh, of course, this is all going to be, this is all part of, of research I've been doing with both my supervisors, Martin Rasmussen and uh, Jeroen Lam, both from Imperial College in the Department of Mathematics. And um, I guess I would need to apologize with, with the people who, who are very interested in, in, in uh, listening to hardcore mathematics because I'm going to be doing like very loose statement. I, I'm going to be... Um, yeah, like the statements are not going to be entirely uh, uh, formal and, and yeah, I, I, I just think um, it, it's, it's better, it was better for this kind of presentation to give an introduction to the, to the topic. I'm aware that not every, everyone is, is um, related to the, to, the, to, the, to the theory of random dynamical systems, although there, there has been a, a talk about it before. But I, I, I just want to share you some, some geometrical ideas, some, some um, statistical properties of bifurcations without going very much into the details of, of the theorems and statements. Um, yeah, so this is the, 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 the table of contents, the, the, the outline for this talk. I'm gonna talk about the, the hysteresis phenomenon in, in, in different scenarios. I'm gonna give you a discrete time model for uh, with 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 some noise, and uh, the, the property here is that the noise is gonna be bounded, uh, as opposed to, for example, when you have Gaussian noise. Um, and then I'm gonna describe this 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 phenomenon called flickering, which has been claimed to be um, an early warning signal for for critical transitions, and a bit of, of an outlook of what 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 uh, I expect to do in the future. Okay, well, uh, I'll I'll start talking about hysteresis, and the way I like to 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 think of hysteresis is is some sort of like <laughs> like some uh, like 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 a diver. So what happens, for example, in South Mexico is uh, in a very famous uh, beach city called Acapulco is that the divers or these people uh, just go up the top of a, of a cliff and they literally just jump into the sea. And I, I, I think they just do it just for fun. And uh, yeah, so this is, this is a, a, some sort of, a, of metaphor of how history is works because imagine you have a, a, a person here at the top of the cliff and then they just start walking very close to this tipping point right and once they jump right it's not like if you if you go back you would immediately go uh, uh, to the top of the cliff you would need to go back for a while probably take a ladder or some stairs and then you get to the top of the cliff again and then you can jump again so the thing about hysteresis is that uh, so here you can see a bifurcation diagram. So the solid blue line is uh, our stable fixed points, right? And the cross, crossed red points are unstable fixed points. So um, if you if you are here close to the to the to the stable fixed points, you will try. You, and and sorry, I, I forgot to mention that in the horizontal line, in the horizontal axis, you have uh, a parameter which I think is called A. So if you move A to the left, so if you get uh, closer, if the diver gets closer to this, to this critical point, right? You stay in uh, close to this stable branch or this solid line. But as soon as you get to this critical value of the, of the parameter, and if you move to the left, then you jump, jump to, the, to the other branch. Now, if you go back, uh, if you uh, turn, the, turn the parameter back to the, to the original state, say the value zero, it's not like you immediately go back to the top of the, to the top branch. Instead, you, will, you would follow this lower branch up to this um, 
a new critical value for, for which you can now jump back again. So when, when the diver jumps into the sea, it's not like you, they, they, they suddenly fly back to the, to the top, right? They need to make an extra effort to go back to the top of the cliff. So this is uh, roughly speaking what hysteresis is. I don't want to get much into the details of what hysteresis is. And uh, I'm gonna give now a discrete time model for, for this phenomenon. Um, so the, ingre the ingredients for, for hysteresis are typically three. Uh, we need some deterministic dynamics. We need a periodic driving of the parameters and we need some noise. So for example, here, uh, we have our deterministic dynamics. This is like a, like a caricature made in the bifurcation diagram. And the periodic driving of the parameter could be, uh, for example, if we move the parameter A back and forth, right? And we include some noise. Now, the typical scenario for this is we take the cusp bifurcation, which is like, um, like the normal form for, the, for um, hysteresis, then we take a slow driving of the parameter and then we take unbounded noise. In this, in this talk, I'm gonna take a completely different scenario. I'm gonna remove for the moment the slow driving of the, of the, of the, of the parameter, but, and now I'm gonna take bounded noise. So the previous uh, scenario is typical for, for what people with uh, stochastic differential equations do. I'm gonna work with, with, with random diffeomorphisms or random maps. So I'll, I'll be more precise here. We have uh, in, uh, in red color my deterministic map. So it has like some sort of sigmoidal, sigmoidal shape. Uh, here you can see a, a better expression of what I mean by this, by this red curve. And we have a parameter A that if we, if we change it, if we, uh, uh, if we make it larger or, or smaller, then we can have some qualitative changes in the system. So for example, for A equals zero, which would correspond to this red curve, uh, we have three equilibria. Uh, the one in the middle is uh, unstable and the other two, which are the, the, the intersections with the identity line, these in, uh, equilibria are stable fixed points. However, however, if we move the parameter A a little bit, um, uh, let, let's, if we make it larger, then we can see that these two uh, equilibria start uh, getting closer and closer and closer up to this point where they collide. They coincide in this point and, uh, and then they just disappear as you can see in this red uh, curve, right? And the only equilibria, uh, equilibrium point that survives is the one on the top. The same happens if we reduce the value of A. Right, so this is this is like a, a typical um, bifurcation scenario for this type of of of, of, of maps. Um, so here, just to fix some ideas, A can can be moved. B is a fixed parameter which is greater than two. Basically, the parameter B measures the the slope of this red curve at the origin, right here. And, uh, and that's how we get the bifurcation diagram. If we change A, we can have, for example, for A equals zero, we have three equilibria. If we reduce it, we have only one, for example, in this region. If we increase it, we have only one, but it's, it's in this uh, top branch. And now we're gonna include some, some noise. So what I mean by this is that we consider this, uh, so for example, if you remove this sigma term, uh, you have the deterministic dynamics and then you add some noise. So it means that at each step, right, because we're considering discrete time systems, uh, at each step we, we, we make some noisy perturbations. We add a, a random term, right? And this is what we call a random, random difference equation. Um, in this case, sigma is going to measure the strength of the noise and the sequence of WN is an IID sequence of random variables, and I assume they're distributed in minus one one. So that's why I say this is, that this is a bounded noise, right? <clears throat> so in some sense, the whole noisy term is is supported in minus sigma comma sigma, and that's why I call it the noise strength. Now, uh, some some important uh, functions are the upper and lower extremal maps. So as I said, WN is distributed in minus one, one. So it's, it's important to study what happens when it's exactly one and when it's exactly minus one. 
okay? And what we are gonna observe, um, it, uh, it's, uh, it's some bifurcations of minimal invariant sets, and I'm gonna be more precise about it later. So first of all, what's an invariant set? So here, the capital F is what people call the set-valued maps. So you take X, and then it's mapped to T of X, and then you include all possible values of the outcomes with the, with the noise, right? So we say that a compact set M is invariant if it's, if it's um, fixed with respect to this set-valued map, right? If no matter where we start in M and no matter which, which value of the noise we, we take, it always remains in M. Some, some nice properties of invariant sets is that um, they all have to be finite union of disjoint invariant intervals. Um, and these intervals have to be, have to be invariant as well. Uh, so if, for example, if instead we take uh, already a, a, an invariant interval, then the, the boundaries are fixed points of the upper and lower extremal map. I'll do some drawings about all of this. Perhaps I should jump to, to the drawings already. Uh, sorry about that. Let me try to go here. So here I have the same picture as before. Uh, so here is the deterministic map T. And uh, if we include some noise, for example, we can take all these possible values. I hope you can see the, the, the picture here, right? I think you get the idea. So at each point X, so if we take X here, um, we have all this range of values. So here is T of X and we can add sigma and subtract sigma at each point, right? So the, set, the, the, the invariant sets are given by the fixed points of the lower extremal map, so this one, and the upper extremal map, this one. So for example, here we find a fixed point of the lower extremal map. Here we find another fixed point of the upper extremal map. So this whole set, this whole set is an, is an invariant set but we could find uh, a different one over here, right? So for example, and I apologize for my drawings. Uh, so here we have another fixed point, we have another fixed point, and then this whole interval is gonna be an invariant set. Of course, these are not the only uh, invariant sets. So for example, if we take this whole uh, interval uh, this is also an invariant set, but uh, the, the, the important thing of, of these little, of, of these subintervals is that they're minimal invariant sets. And minimal invariant sets are very important because um, all ergodic measures of, 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 of the random difference equation are supported on precisely the minimal invariant sets. So what happens when we start increasing the value of, of sigma, the noise strength? So uh, I'll just remove everything that I've done here, because you can see it from the blue lines, the blue dotted lines, I've already, uh, I already have them here because as you can see here, uh, the fixed points of the upper extremal map collide. So here we would have one minimal invariant set. Here we would have another minimal invariant set. And if we increase a little bit the, the value of the noise strength, then this uh, disappears, right? Because now the, the, the first fixed point would be this one. And then we don't see any other fixed point uh, uh, up to until we, we get to this other one. So now the minimal invariant set, as soon as we increase the value of the noise strength, is a very much larger interval. So we say that we, we, we have a topological bifurcation of the invariant sets. So basically they're merging together. I hope this picture was uh, clear for, for, for saying what minimal invariant sets are. So if we consider the bifurcation diagram, sorry, let me go to full screen mode. If we go to the, to the bifurcation diagram of both the upper and lower extremal map, we said that uh, minimal invariant sets are given by the fixed points, so we can just take these intervals here in the bifurcation diagram, and we can see different scenarios. So, for example, if, if the noise strength is not so large, then we have 
uh, roughly what we had in the deterministic case, there's a region of the parameter where, um, where there is only one minimal invariant set, there's a region where we can find two, and there's another region where we find one again, but following a different branch. However, if the noise strength is big enough, then we have this following scenario. So we have always one minimal invariant set, but in this case, they merge together. And that was what I was trying to explain in the, in the previous figure before, right? So this is the, 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 the scenario or the case that I'm very much interested in because we have an intermittency phenomenon where the system might be jumping very close to this, this lower branch, but then it starts exploring a larger region of the state space and it goes back and forth. So in the time series, for example, it looks like this. If we have only the lower branch, the, you, can, you can follow the, the blue time series. It will stay um, in, uh, confined in this region. The same happens if you only have the upper branch uh, given by the red time series. But if you're in the, in, the, in the middle scenario, then you can have like a flickering or some intermittency between those states. Right, and this is what people have claimed. It's a, it's a critical, uh, sorry, uh, an early warning signal for critical transitions. Uh, so this is how the stationary measures would look like. Sorry, the, uh, the stationary densities. Okay, so assume we are in this in this scenario where we where we can uh, observe flickering, and we are interested, for example, in the time it will take the system to escape from this somewhat. Uh, what we call an almost invariant region. So we, if, we, if we observe the system spends lots of time here, how often we, will we observe it jumps out, right? So this is the first question we, we try to, to answer. And for this, um, before I'm, I'm gonna give some, some comments about the flickering phenomenon. So we're gonna fix A, so in the following A is gonna be zero. So we don't change the, sh the shape of the, of the deterministic map, we just change this, the noise strength. And we, we observe that it leads to a merging of the minimal invariant sets. Okay, so flickering can be viewed as a noise-induced phenomenon because of this. So we need to wait a, a, for a large value of sigma to, to observe this merging. And in general, this, this critical value for which the, the minimal invariant sets merge, they don't, it, this value doesn't need to be small. And that's why it's called, well, it's claimed that it's a highly stochastic, uh, sorry, a property of highly stochastic systems. And uh, for, for one-dimensional di one systems with additive noise, it's, it's very easy to calculate. And now we're interested in the time we need to wait for observing flickering. The theory behind this is the theory of quasi-stationary measures. So basically, it's just an extension of, of what a stationary measure is. Uh, so we, we start off with a compact state space. We, we take the Borel sigma algebra. This is the noise space, right? Uh, we considered sequences of, well, IID sequences of, of random variables uh, in, this, in the interval minus one, one. We take a random diffeomorphism as we, we said before. And, um, and we're gonna take M to be the set of allowed states. So what do I mean by that? Um, I'll just go back to the to the drawing. Um, so here, ah, this one. So here we observe a bifurc a critical scenario here, right? So this is our minimal invariant set, and as soon as we increase the noise strength, this is no longer invariant, and we can start exploring the state space a little bit more. So this is gonna be my allowed uh, my my space of allowed states, right? We could escape from M to the complement, and the complement is gonna be called a, uh, a trap or a hole. Okay. And um, yeah, so we're gonna measure the, the escape time from M. So basically it's the first time we are no longer in M under the, the dynamics of this, of this random diffeomorphism. Um, so, as you see, a, a probability measure that basically behaves like a stationary measure, but we need to condition the system to always remain in M, right? So, if we want to calculate the probability of falling into a certain set A, 
starting with this with this initial distribution, which is going to be the, the quasi stationary measure. Um, and if we res if we restrict the system to remain in the in the in the set n, then it must re it basically remains the same, right? Um, this is, as I said, a generalization of what a stationary measure is. It's just basically renormalizing in the end, right? Um, yeah, it's for 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 discrete time systems is enough to prove that this equation holds for n equal one, and uh, that's exactly what we do. So first of all, we we prove there exists a unique quasi-stationary measure on this on this bifurcating set, right? And not only that, but we prove that it converges. Exp um, these transition probabilities converge exponentially fast in the total variation norm. So perhaps uh, it's easier to understand it is if, if we take the densities of, this, of, this, of these measures and it's equivalent to say that the densities converge exponentially fast to the, to the density of the quasi-stationary measure in L1 norm, it's, exact, it's, it's equivalent. And the technique we use is something called the uh, Dublin's mineralization condition. So of course, uh, many people have proved before that there are quasi-stationary measure, quasi, quasi measures in, in random dynamical systems. But the, the, the new thing here is that we, we prove that we have uh, an exponential convergence in, in total variation norm. So why is this important? Uh, we consider now lambda to be the largest eigenvalue of the conditional transfer operator. So basically, this is the operator that uh, tells the, that tells us how densities evolve with with the, with the system, and uh, or equivalently, you can take the stochastic Kupman operator, which is just the average of of, of observables, or uh, I think it's also called the Markov operator to see how measures evolve. Um, in any case, uh, they have the same largest eigenvalue, which is small, strictly smaller than one because we, we, we can escape from the system. And this, this eigenvalue can be approximated by this quotient. So it's the probability starting in any initial point, the probability of uh, remaining in the set M for up to time N plus one, and we divide it by the probability of remaining up to time N. And asymptotically, it gives us the, the value of this eigenvalue. Why is this eigenvalue important? Because for quasi-stationary measures, if we start with that initial distribution, then the mean time, the, the mean escape time is precisely one over one minus lambda, right? So of course, when, when, when sigma goes to the critical value sigma star, remember that at sigma star, the bifurcation point, the set is exactly invariant, and uh, then this lambda becomes one. So we can expect this 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 time to be infinity, right? Because we can't escape from from the minimal invariant set. However, when we plot it in in uh, well, we we make this approximation that we found before, and we observe a flat behavior here. And I apologize here. Um, of course, this this value here should be one. This is just a matter of of, of the scale. So it looks like it's flat, right? So, so if, if, for example, lambda were uh, differentiable, it would mean that all derivatives are, are zero. Um, now the question is, if it's flat, how flat? Because if we give a somewhat nice description of lambda, then we could anticipate how much time we would need to wait. And the first thing I tried to do, just inspired in the large, large deviation principle theory, is uh, plotting it in this scale. So it's uh, uh, here we have log of the of sigma minus sigma star. So the discrepancy with respect to the bifurcation value, and here we have log log of one over one minus lambda. So the the the, the main idea here is that if we see a straight line, it would mean that we have some sort of exponential behavior. And here it looks like the slope is minus zero point nine five, right? So we could conjecture perhaps that the, the slope should be one, but it's, uh, it's modified due to the numerical errors or something. However, this is a very misleading numerical result. And when we did the, 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 the theory, we concluded that in fact, this lambda looks like one minus a flat term, which is of this form. So you can see that it's, uh, it is exponential, but, but not the classical exponential um, 
uh, functions that you find in the large deviation principle theory. Uh, so it, it has this, this shape. And I must, I must say that this is exactly for the case when we have a saddle node bifurcation. So what, what is a saddle node bifurcation is precisely when we have a tangency here and, uh, and uh, two close equilibria collapse for this critical value of the parameters. So this is a, a saddle node bifurcation. Of course, one can think of different bifurcation scenarios, but I'm just going to stick to this one for the moment. And um, yeah, so anyway, so this, this, this term is also flat. So that coincides with what we observed numerically. And if we plot it in, in, in different scales, we see that we have better approximations. So the one over here is exactly the same I had before. So it does look, it does look like a straight line, but the approximation is not. Right, so this is not a typical large deviation principle. So that that was uh, really nice. So this is like some sort of non-standard things that arise from discrete time and bounded noise. And I'm just going to talk about what's going to happen in the future. Uh, so first of all, we have well, as I said, I was interested in the flickering phenomenon just because it's interesting for for the people who study critical transitions. But there's also one one step missing. So so far we've studied how the system can escape from an almost invariant set, like some, some, some set that is kind of reminiscent of the invariance it had before. But now the question is how likely is the system gonna be back, push, pushed back to the, to the almost invariant set, right? So it, it's, it kind of gives us an idea of, of how it goes out and how it comes back. And that's a step missing. The other thing, is, as I mentioned in the in the in the uh, early stage of this of this talk, is that usually people are interested in periodic variation of the parameters, so that you create some sort of a hysteresis loop. And people have observed as well some stochastic resonance, but the stochastic resonance phenomenon has been mostly studied from the the the, the SDE uh, 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 setup. And very little is known for, for, for uh, discrete time dynamical systems. Uh, also, something that people have not really studied thoroughly is the, the random differential equation setting, right? When you have continuous time, but bounded noise. And uh, yeah, so of course there are plenty of possibilities. What if we change the deterministic maps? So what happens if the deterministic map is no longer uh, invertible, but uh, could be like, for example, the, the logistic map or something? What if we change the noise distributions? How do, does this uh, asymptotic behavior changes? And of course, there are so many different ideas of, or of, of research questions that, uh, yeah, it's quite an exciting uh, uh, set up to, 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 to do research on. And yeah, so I'm going to just share some references to you all um, where you can consult uh, things about quasi-stationary measures and, uh, and about flickering and about critical transitions and so on. And um, yeah, large deviation techniques. And lastly, I would like to just thank uh, the National Science Council here in Mexico for, for funding part of my PhD and also Imperial College through the Department of Mathematics. Um, and yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.